This is Amateur Logic, episode 143, for May 15th, 2020. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com, and by ICOM. Get out and be active with the perfect QRP companion, ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Emil. I'm Mike. And hi, I'm Ray. And you can see we've got a full house here tonight and uh, a lot of fun. Pretty much a jam-packed show tonight. There's going to be some good segments in here. And you can see we've got Ray from ICOM with us as well. And he's going to give us a little update on... Uh, wait on a minute, wait here. a minute, wait a minute. You said there's going to be some good segments and then Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like how you played that, George. Uh, well, you know, I don't always get everything just right. I don't know exactly what you're going to be saying tonight. So, we'll and Tommy, see. I'm too far away for him to hit me with one of those sticks that you guys have got. I can poke you with an ink pencil, though. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, yeah, email's got the ruler. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we, we've got uh, several things. Good segments tonight. I think a lot of projects here. And there's bound to be something for everyone here tonight. Mike, what are you going to be showing us a little later? Well, I'm going to be showing you this neat little device called the Husky Lens. And um, unfortunately, there is so little time and so much to show on this guy that uh, I'm going to have to uh, revisit it again. Okay, well, I don't doubt that. It does sound like um, we were talking about it earlier this week. Pretty amazing little device there. Tommy, you've got something that's pretty amazing as well. As a matter of fact, I uh, I watched your segment earlier, and I took the bait. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Tell us what you're going to be showing tonight. Yeah, I've got a, a pretty cool new little hotspot board that I'm going to be showing you. This one's a, a duplex board. So it's, it's pretty nice. It's a little bit different than the other ones that I've used in the past. Pretty excited about having it. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about you having it, too. So excited that I went ahead and <laughs> ordered one. And I would suggest when you see this tonight and you're thinking that you want one, you better go ahead and pull the trigger right then because he's probably going to run out of them until, until uh, sometime later because... Until the next patch comes in. Yep. It's a nice device. And I'm going to show um, a little hacking project tonight, sort of. No, not hacking on a computer. Well, a computer's related in there. Uh, hacking on a radio. I've got a segment entitled Tap That Squelch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. It's going to be good. <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll tell you about that a little later. It, actually, a whole show. It was only going to be 10 minutes with the guest, Richard Bateman, KD7BBC from hamstudy.org and examtools.org. We asked him to come in and just give us a little update on how remote testing was going because he's sort of right up in the middle of it, helping uh, some of the VECs 
get started doing it and uh, providing them the tools they need to do it. Just a couple of weeks ago, still pretty current, we went to 10 minutes. I told Tommy, let's just forget all that other stuff we were going to talk about tonight. Let's just (laughs) hang with Richard. And we got uh, a thorough overview of what goes on with remote testing, some of the challenges and how they have been facing them and, and how it's working and how many people can they test at a time. A lot of questions. We we really grilled them good on it and got some good answers. And I'm very happy to say that, yeah, I think remote testing is uh, very workable. I suggest you go to hamcollege.tv and check out the latest episode and learn all about it for yourself. Richard and his guys are, are a good group. Uh, we started working with him when he first started hamstudy.org. And... He was wanting to get together with the guys at Hamvention and set up their testing on the computers there about six or seven years ago. One other thing I want to mention tonight, and Ray knows something about this too. As a matter of fact, I saw him on there yesterday, Contest University. You know, no date in Hamvention this year. It had to be canceled. And, you know, there's just no way around it. We all know what's going on around the world right now. It'll be back, though, but Contest University was canceled as well. So they decided, let's take it online, make it free for everyone. And I got to say, I spent a good part of yesterday and part of today watching it. It's The last I checked, the live stream of it is on the DX Engineering YouTube channel, you should find it right there. Contest University. I'm going to warn you right now, you're going to want to watch most all of it. You know, I'm not a contester. And Ray will attest to that. I'm not a contester at all. But there was so much good information in there. I mean, it's not just for contesters. Let me put it that way. You're, now, you're there was going, even, they were general ham radio uh, facts in there and even Ward Silver ventured down that pathway that many get in trouble with and that's grounding yes and I listened yeah. to him and, and he made some very good points there and I agree with pretty much everything that he said now maybe I shouldn't say that publicly just to <laughs> avoid controversy myself but no I, I agree with just about everything he said there and a lot of good information on antennas. A lot of good information on setting up your shack and, and being prepared if, you know, an event's coming up. You know, we don't think about it often, but these guys that are big contesters have, have sat there and figured that stuff out. Okay, this needs to be here, that needs to be there. You don't need stuff way over here that you got to get up and go to and uh, unclutter it. A, a lot of really good points there. Um, what type of antennas are going to work best for you in different circumstances? And that's not just a contesting thing. That's uh, any ham type of topic. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Ray, I want to thank, uh, well, of course, Tim Duffy and... Uh, DX Engineering and all the presenters for Contest University this year. But well, I want to thank ICOM America for sponsoring it as well. Well, thank you. We the, the amount of work that went into it from our side of it was very minimal. Tim, Terry, they worked real hard to line everybody up. The moderators, the presenters. I mean, you take a look at easily over 300 years of total experience of ham radio and ham radio uh, contesting. I mean, Frank W3LPL, who's usually at the top of the heap for the multi-multis, he's been doing this for 50 years now. Wow. So, I mean, there's there's all kinds of information, beverage antennas, Yaggies, monobanders, uh, different strategies of operating, how on a modest station you could have fun playing in it. So it, it's it been something that ICOM sponsored 
almost uh, somewhere around 15 years now. Wow. Yeah. And actually, if we had not had all the cancellations and stuff and the event had been held live, I would have been there doing the live stream this year. We yes, sir. Ramping up for that and all prepared and flights and hotels, cars booked. And then, wow, every, everything stopped. So uh, hopefully y'all will let me do it next year. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, the, the response from the Zoom conference was unbelievable. We had an average of 2,400 people in the Zoom conference itself and anywhere between 500 and 700 watching it through the YouTube stream. Yeah. So I, it was a phenomenal turnout. More more people attended it this year than any year in the past. And we've been live streaming it probably for the last five years. Yeah, well, I mean, it was more accessible, you know, to, to a wider variety of people. People who don't even go to Dayton, I'm sure. And I chose YouTube, and the reason I did that is because... I knew I would have to be stopping. I couldn't sit there and watch the whole thing, but watching it, the live stream on YouTube, I could pause it where I wanted to and go do what I had to do and come back and pick up where I left off. And, yep. uh, yeah, I, I just can't say enough about it. I was, you know, I hadn't really ever attended a whole one of those before. Only uh, a few minutes, a couple of times, when our friend... Um, Tom Samasico was doing the live stream there. I didn't know what I was missing. So I'll just put it that way. You guys check it out. They're going to be posting it on, I believe, the Contest University website. And I, it might be individual presentations or, like I said, it, it's last time I checked, the uh, whole thing is still available on YouTube. And it went very well. It went much smoother than I, I thought it would. So they had some good people putting that together. Well, Ray, people are wanting to know about this IC705. It, it got a lot of interest stirred up when we did that video a few months back to sort of introduce it. And I know it well. It should have been introduced at Dayton this year. Of course, that has uh, obviously couldn't happen. Give us an update. Tell us what's going on. Last night there was a new web page launched on iComJapan.com. There's the Japanese website as well as the global site in English. And it answers a lot of the questions that people were having about the new 705. The number one question has been answered, and that is what the current drain is. The specifications that we have are for the battery attached, and then one for running it on 13.8. There's been a little bit of discussion on why is it a higher current at a lower voltage and I mean it's P equals IE it's very very simplistic that way but with running it on 13.8 volts which is pretty much the standard for the QRP radios that are out there it's 260 mils and uh, the receive with the scope the display it's just how you would normally use it instead of the best settings to I could have the least amount of current. And that's been, there, there's been rumors of one amp, or it's going to be one amp. So it was really surprising. And we did take a look at it when we had it down in Orlando to see what the current drain was. And it just blew us away when we saw that number and just had to keep it quiet what we were seeing because we didn't know if it was the, how close to production the prototype was. There was two things. One was the announcement for availability. They are planning on shipping it by the end of June in Japan and depend on each country's certification process on how soon it will become available. So my fingers are crossed. It usually takes six to eight weeks for FCC 
So I'm hoping by the end of July, beginning of August. Awesome. I'm pretty excited about that thing. I can't wait to get my hands on one of them, like a lot of people, I'm sure. Well, I misspoke. I said beginning, end of July, beginning of August. So we're looking at six to eight weeks. It's more like August, September time frame. So I misspoke there. Well, you know, that video is out there. If you want to learn more about it, just go to the ICOM America YouTube channel and it's right there. Uh, well, I guess let's get on in with the show. Ray, are you going to hang out with us or uh, for the whole thing, or what's your plan? No, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you guys handle all of that. I'll be watching and following the chat room, but no one wants to see my ugly mug much longer. Well, I don't know with that mullet man. You know, that's everybody's grooving on it. You're rocking the mullet pretty good, even if it's a fake mullet. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us here tonight. Oh, you're right. talking about the, the headrest. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. move over. That's what's on the headrest of Chicago <laughs> yeah. Bears. So, the Bears. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a good time, and I'll be watching the show. All right. Yeah, right. thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. We'll see you later. But all right, see you guys later. Bye. See yeah. Well, email, I understand you received a care package recently. I did receive a care package. Um, and before I start into that, though, it, that, that rig seems like such a great match for Parks on the Air because there's some people down here in our club that do the POTA thing. And, I, you know, when things get back to normal here, I have a feeling that POTA thing might just balloon and take off. That rig looks like a perfect match for that. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good match for a lot of things. I'm excited about for doing the uh, HOTA. I'm going to call, I'm gonna start a new one called HOTA, like hotels on the air. <laughs> HOTA, all right. <laughs> nice. All right, so anyway, I... uh. I did get a, a package from the Great White North, uh, care of Mr. V3MIC, and uh, it was in the form of a Petit Paquette Avion hmm. from uh, Canada, and one of the first items uh, I was afforded, cheaply at that, if you, um, is going to allow me to, uh, you know, poke and prod with precision. <laughs> Uh, the engineering stick showed up here in this nicely printed case. And uh, I think, Mike, I, I think I might hand this down to my son, who's graduating as a uh, mechanical engineer at the end of this year from Lafayette. So I think he'll be able to poke and prod with precision. So really appreciate that, sir. <laughs> yeah, engineering and stick. An engineering stick. That is a... Uh, Fascinating little uh, package there. <laughs> um, one of the other things I got in my in my package here was uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, which I have to figure out how to uh, assemble here. It looks like to be a, a storm alert device that I need to uh, put together. It's a little kit. Um, it's like a LJM one there from Metheny corporation and let's see what is this madison indiana and wow. it it came with a, a board that looks like was pre-assembled with some of the pieces parts that needs to go inside of that box and some dips some, some chips so my my only issue with this at the moment is uh, as soon as it arrived and it was unpacked and stored completely safely in my house my dogs seem to uh, enjoy the instructions on how to put this together. So the Weimaraner strike again. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just have to figure this one out, Mike. I'm, I'm sorry in advance. I'm hoping it's going to work. But uh, I might have to do some pirate map assembling to get this to work. <laughs> uh, good luck getting those other pieces. I think, I don't know if it's going to focus on that. Yeah. But it looks like a... a the Metheny Corp um, 
Storm Alert Emergency Decoder Model LJM number number one. There, he also uh, sent me some cheesies, which which didn't make it to tonight's showing. <laughs> and it wasn't my it wasn't my dogs who ate them it this time. It was me. No, it wasn't the Wamaraner. It, it it was me. They didn't quite make it there. But uh, I got to hand it to them. There was a uh, a nice. You know, the things that come from Mike's direction have a nice little French flair to them here. And you can see there, it's uh, got real cheddar cheese, which also is written in French there below. It says, Vrai Fromage Cheddar. So, that's some... Um, they were they were really good. I, th I appreciate that, Mike. It's uh, pretty darn tasty. I think they might rival some of our uh, chiwis we have down here in our area. So... Appreciate it, Mike. That's something to receive something from other uh, parts parts of the world. After months of extensive development and testing, it's finally here and ready to take remote operation to another level. The new RigPi station server from MFJ and Howard Nurse W6HN is going to change the way you think about getting on the air. Why be bound by the four walls of your ham shack when you can take it with you wherever you go? The MFJ1234 Rig Pi lets you operate from anywhere you have an internet connection on your Apple or Android mobile device, iPad, tablet, Kindle, laptop, or desktop computer without additional hardware. Just fire up any web browser and get on the air. Rig Pi connects to most any transceiver with cat control. Operate single sideband, CW, AM, FM, digital, or any mode your radio supports. Operate your rotor. CW King, digital modes, logging, spot monitoring, call book lookups, and more. 32 user programmable macros let you control the features you want. Two or more hams from different locations can operate different radios at the same time using a single rig Pi. The MFJ1234 Raspberry Pi's Raspbian operating system comes with many free programs installed, like FT8, RIDI, WSJTX, FL Digi, a word processor, email, and spreadsheet. Plus, thousands of Linux-based programs, including many for ham radio, are available. The RigPi Station server is available as separate modules, allowing you to customize it a piece at a time, or get the complete unit with RigPi Base, OS firmware, audio board, and CW keyer board. The RigPi audio board connects to your radio and serves send and receive audio to your mobile device, or use it to operate digital modes like FT8 and FL Digi. It includes IQ inputs for use in pen adapters and has built-in isolation transformers for RF and Humphrey audio. The keyer board generates perfect Morse code using the popular K1EL wind keyer chip. Just connect your favorite paddle. Software modules for RigPi will be available on GitHub as a free open source download so you can add your own features in the future. Get your MFJ1234 RigPi today and take your remote operation to the next level. MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com. And thanks, MFJ, for sponsoring Amateur Logic. Tommy, why don't we go ahead and look at this special device that, that you've got here? You want to set it up? Yeah, it's... Uh Yep, I've shown quite a few different little digital mode hotspots for ham radio, and, and I've liked pretty much all of them that I've played around with, but I think I might have found a, a new favorite one. Um, let's check it out, and I will talk a little bit about it after my segment's over. Cool. Not too long ago, I showed you my little Zoom USB I got at Dayton last year. Well, I got a new little hotspot to play with, and I think this might be my favorite one yet. I still love my DV Mega, and I like my Zoom USB pretty good, but this is a different ball game for me. It's a small form factor. It uh, fits a Raspberry Pi Zero. I've got a Pi Zero W here that I bought at Micro Center in Dallas a long time ago. I've got the duplex version of the board. Just notice there's two antennas. The, it's got the little header pins over here and a place for a display. I, I went ahead and soldered this connector on here. And I bought a little OLED display off of Amazon for, I think it was like $8 or something like that. And I soldered these pins on so I could put it onto the board. This board is a smaller form factor. It draws less current 
than the full size pies. So if you're going to run it off of a battery pack, like a lot of people do when they're traveling, this is really nice for that because it's going to make your battery last a fair amount longer. I haven't timed it yet, although I did measure the current draw on it. So let's uh, let's go ahead and put it back on the pie and take a look at and see what this thing will do. This board's created by N5BOC David Dennis out of Dallas. Uh, if you look at it real close, you can see that it's really nicely made. It fits the Pi Zero W perfectly. I'll go ahead and put my display on it so you can see what's going on. I'll use this battery for my testing today. Let's hook the power supply up. My Pi Zero W did not come with these pins. So, as you can see right here, I had to solder these on myself. I didn't have any double row header pins, so I used two single rows. It works just fine. I had a lot of those laying around, so it, it fits just perfectly. It did take me just a few minutes. Just be careful when you solder them and make sure you don't have any solder bridges back there. I've got my handy volt ohm USB meter I picked up at the ham fest last time I went to Huntsville. I already configured PyStar for this board. I just downloaded the image off of PyStar website. You can get the URL right here. And we've gone through the setup on it numerous times. I will show you the things that are specific for this. Now this board supports the same things that uh, PyStar supports. So you can do DSTAR, of course, uh, DMR, uh, Fusion, supports pretty much everything PyStar supports. And you can see we're booting up and it's using... 0.3 amps a little over 0.3 amps at the moment and you can see it got connected it's on dstar by default so i'm gonna go ahead on my computer here and i'm gonna log into my pi so let's go into the configuration the one thing about the uh, pi zero w it is a little bit slower than the regular uh, full-size pies the pi 2 and the pi 3 and the 4 as a matter of fact, if you notice here on the setup, we normally set up simplex mode, but here we're setting up duplex, just like a regular repeater. I've got D-Star mode turned on. Um, I'm using two frequencies, my receive frequency, my transmit frequency from the device. 434, it's receiving. So that means my handy talkie is going to have to transmit on 434. Then the transmit frequency is 439. Uh, be careful to stay out of the satellite range. If you look at the chart here from the ARRL, I'm just 1 megahertz on the outside of both ends of the satellite bank range. So I should be good to go there. Even though this thing is very low power, uh, be courteous and stay out of the satellite section. And then I've got my rough coordinates here. When we set up our modem type, we have to pick the MMDVM HS dual hat uh, for GPIO pins so I picked that one and then I set up the rest of the things just like normal and it, it worked great let's try it I'm gonna connect from the control panel here on this one so I'll go back into the admin section and there's usually somebody on one Charlie so let's do link request change you'll see down here on the display that it did work and, and you can hear the audio coming from from my handy talkie. Uh, when I key up, it'll transmit with a five megahertz split. I created an entry in my handy talkie with the five megahertz split. I put my receive frequency in, and then I put a minus five megahertz offset on it. And you can see that right here. I use the free icon software for the radio which i always use that anyway it works great for me i don't see any reason to to change so i'll go ahead and turn this off and let's uh let's unlink and we're not linked so let's go into our configuration again and let's try it with dmr i'm, I'm not a big dmr guy i got this one little dmr handy talkie I got to talk to Mike, our buddy here, VE3MIC, because he, at the time, he wasn't on D-Star, although he is now. Uh, but I went ahead and set it up to see how it worked. So let's go ahead and turn off D-Star mode, turn on DMR, apply the changes, and I'll show you the settings here. 
And you can see down here on the display it says close, start up, so it's booting up. Now this uh, does dis support other displays, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Still using the same frequencies for DMR. Uh, if you look here, you'll see how I set up my channels on DMR on the radio. You can actually have two connections going at one time on two different time slots. So if you look here, I've got Mike's repeater on one of them, and then I've got it pretty much everything else on the other. So I can always connect a mic. And if I decide to listen around to something else, I, I can. Um, like I said, the main reason I got it was to talk to him. Uh, but, you know, while I'm on there, if I may listen to something else at the time. To set up a display, it's just the default stuff. To, to use this small OLED type, just pick OLED type 3. Um, set it up to Dev TTY AMA 0. And then this next gen, I, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But this layout right here, I just picked the default. When I tested it, it doesn't actually matter. If you change this to this next-gen type display, if you get one of those, then I think you can change the way the text looks. But for this little OLED, it's uh, pretty small, and you only get one layout, which, which is fine for me. And then you just go down and set up your DMR stuff like you normally would. I've got it set up to color code 1. And that's pretty much it. It's super simple to set this thing up. It's almost a tongue twister. Let's uh, let's just try it real quick on DMR. So we'll go back to the admin page. We'll turn this radio on. Okay, I've got the 3100 talk group here. So I'll go ahead and connect to that. And now you can see I've got DMR going. And I'll go connect to Mike's. Peter, VE3RIG. And if you look at my screen here, you can see I've got time slot one for Mike's repeater. Time slot two is set up for everything else in my code plug. Uh, 3100 is the national one. And you can see it's working. I've got both going at the same time. So let's just ID in 5Z and O. So it's pretty slick. Don't ask me a lot of questions, the technical part about the DMR stuff, because I'll be honest with you, that's about as far as my knowledge goes on it. I'm a D-Star guy, and I always default back to that, but sometimes if I need, want to talk to Mike, I will fire this up and give it a try. When it's idle, it's using about 0.2 amps and point 0.2 to point 0.3. So let's see how many it draws when it's receiving me. VE3 MIC in 5Z and O. VE3 MIC in 5Z and O. Roughly about the same. I hear my RF getting back into my speaker though. And you, you would know when I'm gonna try to do my demo that there's not much activity on here. It's a super nice board. Uh, it's a pretty low current draw compared to the bigger pies with the other boards on top of them. Again, if you look at the chart, I've got a Pi 3B+, plus, which is about 500 milliamps just for the board. And I've got a Pi 0W, which is 150 milliamps for just the board. Uh, so right now I've got a display and this modem board on top of it. So that's the extra current draw you see. And uh, so that's going to that's gonna make your battery last quite a bit longer. But that said, I charged this up and I ran this hotspot here literally all day long and I had about a little over half a battery left by the end of the day. And I'm talking about a, like probably about a 10 hour day. I turned it on when I came to work and I left it on for a few hours after that till I got ready to settle in and I turned it off later. So pretty sure this is my new favorite hotspot board. And I really love the form factor of it. I'll be putting it in a case coming up pretty soon. I'll probably do a separate segment on, on creating a case and with a little window for the display. Not sure what I'm going to do yet. Maybe 3D print something or I may just build something by hand. We'll see. You can find them on at a N5BOC site. The URL is right here below. The low power consumption is great if you're going to travel with it. You know the digital modes don't use a lot of data anyway, so I can use the hotspot on my cell phone and a small pocket-sized battery and run this thing for quite a long time sitting on the seat of my vehicle. 
a rental car or something when I'm traveling. You should see it uh, in some more of my segments coming up in the near future. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time. 73. I'm going back to D-Star. Yeah, it's a great board, and I guess you can see I couldn't wait to make the case. I was going to go through a whole uh, deal with uh, another segment to build one, but anyway, I found one. This one here, and it wasn't made to use this to show the display, so what I did was I, I remixed it. On, this is on Thingiverse.com, so if you go and find that one and you click on uh, remix remixes or whatever, you'll see it links to mine. And uh, that's what I did. I just basically elongated it just a little bit, made it a little taller, and put a window in that fits my display in the right spot. And you can see on the little picture that popped up there, it's a pretty nice fit. It's, uh, it's such a good tight snug fit that i really didn't even have to screw it in it just fit in there and it stayed perfectly so when i screw the case together it just kind of holds everything um, of course you can screw it in if you want to but i just didn't see the need that looks nice how would a fella go about talking his buddy into printing him one too maybe uh trip to mo's at lunchtime one day or something like that <laughs> when all this uh craziness in the world going on gets a little bit less yeah we might have to do takeout yeah that'll work and you can sit so, in your truck and i'll sit in mine <laughs> that'll work <laughs> so tommy the, the the advantage there duplex so i'm guessing you could be talking on both of those time slots and then dmr side is that yeah look yeah i only have the one dmr radio i'm like i said i'm not a big dmr guy so yeah but it looks like i tried testing it with mike and it looks like I can have both of those going at the same time. And I can switch back and forth between them and talk on one. And it appears that the other one is still transmitting. It, it may yeah. not be. But it, but the one, the main thing is, you know how you get in, uh, like if you listen to one of the uh, talk groups or one of the reflectors and somebody's real long-winded and you want to disconnect, well, the device will still accept the commands. Um, gotcha. Just, nice. Yeah. Control, yeah, okay. I can see some advantages there. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, he made such yeah. an impression on me with that segment there that uh, I pulled the trigger this afternoon. I ordered one. Mike's going to change computers there, so maybe he can get back. He lost audio, y'all, for anybody who didn't notice. Uh, if you can read, though, you probably noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, man, you know that's been my biggest pet peeve with with using a hotspot is that once you connect to something, buddy, if there's a lot of traffic on there, you're stuck. You're not going anywhere yeah. uh, because yeah. you know you can't get back into it until until somebody comes up for air and leaves a little space in there where you can get a command back to your hotspot. But this will solve that, won't it? Oh, yeah, it will. So I had that problem today when I was listening to uh, one of the D-Star reflectors. And uh, it, would, it just kept going and going and going. And I finally I thought about it. I said, oh, yeah. So I just hit the and sent the U command over there to, to unlink, and it just did it. No problem. Yeah. I really nice. like it. The squelch open signal. You know, you don't have that on, on your average uh, two-meter rigs. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no squelch open signal that you can you can access with a connector on there. And so we've been running with Vox here for years. And it worked, but if somebody paused a while, you know, it would drop. And then key back up, and then the party on the other end, well, the repeater drops, so they start talking. And it's just a, you know, kind of a problem, so... I modified both of these radios, two different brands of radios, to give me a squelch open signal that I could tie back into the serial port of the computer and, and give me a signal to say, okay, we're finished receiving, so, uh, you know, trigger echo link to, to go back to uh, receive mode, stop, stop uh, sending the audio over the internet. Here's what I came up with. It um, it worked a little easier on the Raspberry Pi, although I did get it to work on Windows as well. I know how to do that now. 
because uh, TTL signal, which is what I got coming out of these radios, and a serial port signal are two different things. They're not serial ports are not TTL level. Um, so, without further ado, let's take a look at tap that squelch. <laughs> Older radios often get repurposed for other uses. Many of those applications will allow you to use Vox on the receive signal. However, that's not always the best solution. If you could get a squelch open-close signal straight out of the rig, that would usually be more reliable than Vox. I did this modification recently on a Yaesu radio for our SVX Link project. And it worked out just fine. Of course, it's connecting to a GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi, which uses TTL logic. So the 5 volt signal that came from the transistor was perfect for that. This Radio Shack has a similar squelch circuit in it. However, we're going to be connecting it to a PC on a serial port, which is not TTL logic level. And the two didn't agree with each other so much. So, I had to build a little buffer circuit to put in here. We've used this rig for years for a local Echolink node, and it has worked great the whole time. It's pretty much just a stock Radio Shack HTX212. Now, you can see we've made a change there. Well, not really a change, an addition. I've added a fan on the back here to blow on the heat sink just to keep it cool because, you know, it could spend an extended period of time keyed up being used on a repeater with Echolink. The first step is to download the service manual for the radio if you don't already have it. I just did a quick search for HTX212 and came right up with the service manual for this rig. I'm going to go ahead and open up the radio now, but tell you that you should look in the theory of operation for the radio and many times it's going to describe all the circuits that are in the radio. And we're interested in the squelch circuit. On this rig, they call it the mute circuit. I found an almost identical circuit in the Yaesu radio that I modified earlier, and this one. The theory of operation says the carrier signal is detected at pin 13 of IC2 and regulated by C53 and then DC amplified by the internal amplifier circuit at pin 10 of IC2. The amplified DC signal is applied to pin 12 of IC2 via squelch VR602 and then converted to logic level by internal comparator of IC2. And then here's the key sentence. The output level is buffered and phase reversed by Q12 and is applied to the busy signal of the microprocessor by pin 14 of connector 2. This is where we want to, and to borrow a phrase from Tommy, tap that thing. I looked over the schematic in the service manual and found IC2. It's right there in the yellow rectangle. Right above it was Q12, you'll see in the blue rectangle. So I connected a wire right there at the collector, and we're using that as our open squelch signal. It'll go to plus 5 any time the squelch is open. Now you see this wire going here? That's where I'd already been in and tapped into the circuitry. And you see that runs to an RCA connector I mounted on the side over here. Since there were no other holes in the rig, and there were two holes for mounting screws here, we're not using a mounting bracket anyway, I just slightly drilled out that hole and mounted the RCA connector right there. And this is where we'll plug the squelch lead going on up to the PC. The only way I could get the wire through to the other side of the board where that transistor is mounted is to just kind of run it through a gap there. So let's look at the other side where we actually tap into the board. There is the integrated circuit that the squelch signal is being processed in. And here is Q12. That's what we're interested in. You can see the three leads here on it. And the way I found that, of course, is I looked at the drawings in the service manual to determine where it was located. 
Now, it didn't tell me which was emitter, base, or collector on this transistor, but it was easy enough to figure out where I needed to tap. I took a multimeter and measured from ground to each pin and looked for voltage with the squelch open and with it closed. And I found that this spot right here went to plus 5 every time the squelch was open. Knowing that, I tapped in right here and ran the wire on through the other side. And that actually worked, feeding the CTS pin on the computer for a little while, and then all of a sudden it just wouldn't work. It was loading down the circuitry in the rig here, and you could turn the squelch open, and you wouldn't even see a busy light come on the radio. It was affecting the circuitry so bad. Unplugged it, and the squelch acted normal again. So we're going to need to insert a little buffer to give us some isolation between the squelch circuitry of the rig and the serial port CTS pin on the Echolink computer. I tried a couple of different circuits using transistors and just couldn't come up with anything that seemed stable. So I turned to a hex inverter. The SM74HC04 is six hex inverters in one package. It uses very little current and has very little loading on the circuit it's connected to. You can see we're only using two sections here. All the other inputs are tied high so that they won't be flipping back and forth with noise. This is common with unused sections. We take the squelch open signal from the collector of Q12 and connect it to pin 1. That's the input of the first section. The output comes out pin 2, inverted. So if we put a low in on pin 1, we get a high out on pin 2. Pin 2 feeds pin 3, the input to the next section. This will reverse the phase of the signal once more. Whatever's coming in the input, high or low, will be present on the output on pin 4. There's a good reason to do this. While Echolink would have allowed us to use a low to indicate squelch open, the problem with that is, if you lose power to the rig or it's shut down, then the echo link's going to get a squelch signal full time and stay open. Ground is connected to pin 7, and our plus 5 volts DC is connected to pin 14, as well as the other inputs. We need 5 volts DC to operate this chip, and of course the radio is designed for a 12-volt system. I knew there would be a 5-volt regulator inside it, so I searched around till I found it, and this is it, pointed to by the red arrow. I had often wondered who made this radio for Radio Shack. I think I solved that mystery. If you follow the blue arrow, you'll see the number MTX-146. I entered that into Google, and I got a hit. The radio received a grant of equipment authorization from the FCC in 1994 in the name of the grantee Midland Radio Corporation. I don't guess I knew Midland made any two-meter rigs. Now back to our project. If we look at the bottom of the PC board, on the left-hand side with the red arrow is Q12's collector, the plus 5-volt DC squelch open signal. On the right-hand side, as indicated with the blue arrow, that is the output of the 5-volt regulator we found, so I've got the red wire connected there. Here's a piece of strip board I mounted the hex inverter to, and you can see the wires there. The red one is the plus 5. The gray one is the signal coming from the collector of Q12, our squelch open signal. The white one runs back to that RCA connector on the outside of the rig, and the black one, of course, is ground. To protect this, to keep it from shorting out, I wrapped it in a piece of heat shrink tubing and then stuffed it down inside the power supply compartment in the rig. If we look inside the SysOp setup in Echolink, on the TX control panel, you'll see that I had set serial port to be COM1, which is the only serial port in this computer, and I've got DTR checked as being push to talk to activation. And I've checked key PPT on local transmit. That's how we key up the rig. It's using the serial port for that. 
Now we're using it for our receive control as well. Rather than have it on Vox like I always did in the past, we're changing it now to be Serial CTS and to use COM port 1. We have the choice to invert the sense. That means if the CTS pin on the serial port went low, that would be detected as carrier and the squelch open signal. However, we're not doing that because our signal goes high whenever the squelch is open. And that's the only two things there that use a serial port. Here's what the pinout looks like on it. Pin 5 is ground. Pin 4, DTR, is going to the radio push-to-talk circuit. We didn't look at that today, but I'm using a little read relay to handle that. Pin 8 is CTS, and that's where the output of our squelch open circuit connects. Now let's see if our open squelch signal is being detected. I'll open the squelch on the rig, and you'll see it's indicating signal right down here on the status bar. If we were connected to another station right now, we'd also see push to talk showing up on here. I close the squelch, the signal goes back away. So this is working exactly as intended. And it's going to be much more reliable than depending on Vox. Nice. It, uh, it does work much better than using Vox. Although the Vox had been working, you know, this, this just works better because then you don't get people stepping on each other quite as much. Yeah. Cool. I don't know if you've been using that radio for years and years and years, man. Yep. We have. I never knew it was made by Midland. I always thought maybe it was an Alenco or something. Yeah, I never had a clue. Yeah, I didn't either. I I heard rumors, uh, not that particular radio, that uh, uh, you remember the uh, handy talkies that Radio Shack produced? I think they made a, a 70 centimeter as well as a 2 meter radio. HTX 202 and 404? That's the ones. Somebody told me that they were, um, I, I don't know if they were Standard or Midland that made those, but they, I remember the battery packs on them had the same, almost the same mechanism that the old IC2AT had, uh, the slide-on battery clip. Um, and for a while there, the rumor was that uh, maybe whoever was making the ICOM IC02AT uh, was making that one as well, but I don't think that's actually true. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know. I would be surprised. The, the only thing I can tell you for sure is uh, most of the scanners were made by uh, GRE in Japan. Hmm. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know I, that. So, uh, I sorry, it. folks. I uh, had some audio problems. I, I still don't know what the cause was. Um, Skype was just starting to give me errors, and then all of a sudden I lost all my audio, both uh, the microphone and, uh, and the uh, speaker audio. And no matter what I did, I couldn't bring it back. So I, you'll probably notice that the background's changed, and uh, I think it's because uh, I probably got sand in my computer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you just fired up the amplifier. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it, it's still cold enough. Uh, the furnace is still coming on at night. Uh, the other night it was uh, minus three, and this is crazy for May. Wow. wow. Well, Mike, seeing you wear that cap there gives me an idea of where we could take a quick break here and then come back and learn more about that project you've been working on. Yeah, just before you go, uh, George, I thought I'd start something new. And uh, obviously, I knew Ray was coming on the show tonight, so I wore the ICOM cat. And uh, I don't know if I tilt my head down. You might be able to see the, the maple leaf on there. This is a Canadian version of the ICOM, ICOM ball cap oh, wow. um, that I got a swag a few years ago. So yeah. Nice. And tonight is, in case nobody noticed it, it is... Hawaiian shirt night, and that was kind of like a last-minute thing. Uh, emails got got laid there, so he's <laughs> in, in good what? shape. Mike, you've got something on your shirt, don't you? I can't can't see it. You may have to stand I think up. It's, uh, palm trees. Uh, 
Yeah, we can't see it. Your, your bottom half is a tube. Oh, you can just stand up. Maybe you, maybe not. Yeah, it's it's a little. It's not too subtle. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the few times I actually got by wearing a green shirt. It didn't become transparent. Yeah, we had to do a test to make sure. Uh, these, <laughs> my shirt, I think maybe Tommy's too, came from our friend Andy, uh, AA0WX, Andy Anderson. Yeah, see, he's probably in the chat room. Yeah, you. There he is. Yeah. And, and these are authentic. I mean, these are actually from Hawaii. So. I'm trying to remember, uh, was it Tommy Bahama? And uh, he had quite the line of ties and shirts with wine patterns on it. They were pretty nice. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I put this on and I, I feel like just laying around on the beach or something. <laughs> I definitely spared no expense on these. These are not from Hawaii. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I noticed that uh, Sean KM4 so, SF. So Emil, are they like, are they like the beads you get at Mardi Gras? <laughs> no, no, not not even that. It's the uh, Hawaiian lays you get from the dollar store. <laughs> oh. Talking to the cheap old man here, man. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that uh, Sean KM4SFF over in the chat room said, we need a toga night. And I tried to get Emil to wear a toga tonight, but uh, he, he wouldn't do it. He so. wasn't going for it, huh? I shudder to think what Mike is going to do with that, because he's already known <laughs> to put me in toga situations. <laughs> yeah, so we know that it's a, a rocking look, you know. <laughs> And and we also know that toga parties and guitars don't mix. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers and a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo or just over 2 pounds. With RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM as well as full D-star functions a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, and live band scope with waterfall, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card for data storage, it comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. And thanks ICOM for sponsoring Amateur Logic here. And all the other things that you sponsor. I don't know that anybody sponsors as many uh, activities as them, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I, I was thinking about that earlier when you were talking about the uh, Contest University thing. I don't think anybody really gives back to the ham community as much as ICOM does. And we appreciate it. Well, Mike, Husky Lens, it makes me think like you've got some problems with the... With the vertical, you know, on your display, and maybe it's kind of squishing your picture down, and you look, you know, sort of like the look you would have if you were trying to watch, uh, you know, an old standard def program stretched out to fit on a 16 by 9 monitor. Is that what it is? <laughs> 
Well, it's a lot of things, but I don't think that's it. But hmm. um, it uh, was a challenge trying to get to, to get anything or recorded off this little device because it's so tiny, and it's um, probably the, the, the first really close-up work that I've ever had to do um, by trying to shoot video off of It's like trying to shoot a camera that's taking a picture from a monitor. <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain it, but um, uh, it was it was kind of tricky. But uh, I wish um, I wish we had um, more time to talk about it. But uh, uh, I might do more about uh, 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 more with it uh, as time goes on because there were certain functions I wasn't able to talk about or or, or demonstrate, and uh, part of that had to do with the fact that I'm trying to. Uh, work with an image as the uh, picture source or the image source and uh, some of it doesn't work quite so well especially for object tracking. Hi everyone, Mike B3MIC here. Typically amateur logic is about amateur radio but it's also about technology. Today I want to show you something that arrived at my doorstep just last week. It's a Gravity Husky Lens AI vision sensor camera from DF Robot. What makes this interesting is that this one and a half by two inch device can operate standalone. All it needs is a five volt power source, but it can also communicate real time data to a serial or I squared C device such as these. The Husky Lens built in features are color detection, object detection, object tracking, QR code tag recognition, line detection, and face detection. You can even have some of these features running at the same time, such as line tracking and tag recognition. Let's take a look. So let's have a look to see what you get with the Husky Lens board. You get the board itself, including a two megapixel camera, mounting hardware, a couple of brackets, uh, which is a really nice uh, addition to the kit so that you can mount the Husky lens on a project. And also an interface cable to connect your Husky lens to a single board computer such as a Raspberry Pi or Arduino. And uh, that's basically all you need to get started. Let's have a closer look at the uh, component side of the Husky lens board. And I'll point out a few of the uh, major important components on the board itself. There's our 2 megapixel camera. In this diagram we can see the selector button and we can also see the selector wheel uh, for scrolling through the menus. And lastly here's a view of the LCD the 2 inch display side of the board. Okay I have the camera close up on the Husky lens and we're going to power it up. And I'm going to walk you through some of the menus here. I don't know if you can see that. It's pretty quick, but the, it displays a little Husky Lens logo. Uh, and then it's immediately booted up. So it's pretty quick. Anyway, uh, when you first turn it on, that's what you'll see. And if I press the little selector button, I can scroll through the various menus on the device. Um, and we're going to have a look at some of these uh, various algorithms or functions. But the first thing we want to do is have a look at the general settings. And here you set your protocol, protocol type uh, for either I squared C or serial and of course your baud rate. Um, one of the first things I'm going to want to do is change the uh, the delay time on the um, on the timeout. So let's go back into settings because uh, our, our menu is auto hiding after five seconds which is a little annoying. Um, so let's set that up for 20. Um, I should also mention that there's an LED on the front uh, which is supposed to help with uh, low level lighting uh, for the camera but I haven't tested it out yet. Um, and there's also an RGB LED on there that you can change 
Uh, I'm not really sure what the purpose of that is for. Um, probably if you wanted to do different functions and you needed a visual check uh, without being directly up and looking at the uh, menu screen, uh, you could see the uh, color of the LED and maybe a flashing pattern. Um, but um, there's the version I'm running, 0.47.4.7. Um, so it's, it's still pretty much in the early stages. Uh, the device does support various languages as well. Um, screen brightness, I probably want to put that up to 100%. Um, and I'm going to save that. And uh, next we're going to have a look at uh, some of the functions or the algorithms that are built in. Okay, let's do uh, some basic color recognition. And we're going to go to our menu and make sure that we're selected on color recognition. And I should also point out that there is a secondary function. So if you do a long press when you're on a menu selection, it pops up with a secondary window. So in this case, we want to be able to learn more than one at a time. So we're going to select Learn Multiple. And we've got the maximum number that we can select. It's already set for us. And we're going to return and save, or save and return. And now we should be able to recognize colors. So I'm just going to move the camera around. And you can see my crosshair. It's kind of f uh, fading in and out. And when I've got a capture that I would like, I've detected the first color, red, and it's given it an ID color of 1. Now I'm going to do the same thing for blue. It's detected the blue. Now we'll do our yellow. There we got all three colors that are being detected. Okay, moving to object detection. The Husky lens can detect up to 20 different objects. And you can see in the list there that there's basically, um, well, four different categories. Vehicles, some household items, animals, and, uh, and people. Um, one of the interesting things I discovered by accident was that these same 20 uh, objects that it's able to identify just happen to be part of a Pascal uh, visual object recognition uh, uh, contest that was held in the mid-2000s. And, uh, and I guess they used the same data uh, to be able to write the software in order to detect these uh, particular objects. Okay, now I have the Husky lens set up for uh, object recognition. Let's see what it can detect. It's pretty good at detecting people. Uh, no, that's not a cat. Uh, that's a car. It looks like a couple of Clydesdales pulling a Budweiser wagon, but there's two. Uh, I think that image is too busy that it's having difficulty with that one. Um, that's a really tough picture of a chair. Um, like I said, it's very, very, very good at picking out people. Uh, objects have a boat with people in it. Oh, well, it's found the cow. And last but not least, my favorite of all the functions or algorithms that are built into the Husky lens, and that's the face recognition. Now I've gone ahead and, and set the Husky lens uh, to identify Georgia and Tommy's face. And we're going to have a look at some video just to see how well it's able to keep a, a recognition on, on both of them. Tell even even as they uh, change positions, 
or move their head, it's still able to identify. Um, now, mind you, I'm actually looking at a video, so everything's straight, strictly two-dimensional. Two and one of the neat things about the algorithm for face recognition is it's able to uh, identify from various planes. So ideally what you'd want to do, and this is all explained in the wiki, is take several shots um, of an image or a person's face rather, and uh, that gives you the best uh, reliability in terms of uh, face recognition. But even if I go to other episodes, uh, I've even gone back quite a few episodes from probably a year ago and it doesn't have any trouble identifying George or Tommy. So as long as the face uh, hasn't changed all that much, it will uh, identify them. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for this this time, but uh, I hope to get back at the, uh, the Open Web RX project that I was uh, working on on the previous episode. And in the meantime, I'm going to keep playing with this Husky lens because uh, for something uh, that costs around the $40 mark, it's, uh, it's both exciting and uh, actually kind of scary at the same time. So, 7-3, uh, and uh, thanks for listening from VE3MIC. Quite interesting at that price. Yeah, I was going to check with the cheap old man to see whether or not it was uh, cost-compliant or not, <laughs> considering what it does. <laughs> you know... Uh, it, it, the price doesn't so much scare me as I'm wondering what you're doing with it. Uh, uh, you, you ever watch the show The um, Person of Interest? Uh, I haven't watched it myself, but I, I know of it. I okay. thought you were going to say Black Mirror. No, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you're starting to build your own Samaritan computer over there, that, which they use to monitor <laughs> everybody in real time all over the world. <laughs> Well, the interesting it started thing off is. with us being the first two victims. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to delve into, um, I had some video shot of me sitting up the I Square C bus, uh, but I didn't get uh, much further than that. And of course, uh, this, this video ran long enough as it is. But as I was saying, I, I didn't have a chance to, uh, to demonstrate some of the other cool features like uh, object tracking and um in the line tracking or the line following in the in the tag reading and uh once once i get uh, the next piece set up uh where i'm actually reading live data then we'll see how well it it recognizes qr codes so can it can it identify the person that the face is on or just that it's a face yeah. Oh, no. Um, it, it, you'll notice, like, if you and George... Well, actually, you know what? I wonder if it's still in memory here. Let I hope not. It, oh, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, so you can't see this because I'm looking at the screen. But I'm pointing, I'm pointing the device at you right now. And you were Face ID, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in the video. And you're still Face ID 1. And if I aim it at George, he's Face ID 2. And when I, <laughs> when I aim it at Emil, it's just recognizing him as a face or a, or a pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So you could sit set that thing up and maybe use it to unlock your computer if you sit if you were the one sitting in front of it or you're something i don't know something yeah i would imagine it's it's not all that different from uh some of the the higher end flagship phones have face recognition to unlock uh, my work my work phone does it's actually really amazing the only thing that it picks me up if I've got sunglasses on, whatever. Uh, the only thing it stops it is if I have a mask on, like right. And and in the wiki, it explains. Um, uh, actually, it, it it actually uses Rowan Atkinson as Mr. Bean uh, as some sample images. It's pretty funny, That's and a good uh, <laughs> they show several different uh, uh, poses of him, and it recognizes him at each and every time. So. Um, and as, as I was mentioning in a video, it, it actually learns um, 
sa- or I guess it's samples, for lack of a better word, uh, from different planes. Um, so if you have an actual object, and um, rather than pointing it at a screen, which is only two-dimensional, um, it would even be better um, for, uh, for accuracy that way. And you can see in the video that it had trouble identifying uh, some of the objects from those uh, 20 objects that, that it, it can recognize. Um, but if you point to an actual um, kind of three-dimensional image of those objects, it's, it's pretty much spot on every time. Hmm. It's too bad it doesn't do like voice recognition too. We could actually run Ray's voice through it from when he was on the show a little earlier and rocking Ray from the Christmas album and see if that really was Ray. <laughs> we could do, we could do an analysis on that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I hope to get it uh, hooked up. T- uh, I started uh, configuring it for the Raspberry Pi using the I squared C and I'm kind of interesting, interested to see what kind of data it's uh, actually uh, outputting. As it yeah. as it recognizes objects and things. So can yeah, you name the cool objects? Point. I mean, could you have named you know Tommy instead of Face ID named him Tommy? Um, I I can't in the in the device itself is is limited in such that it only assigns a tag ID. Um, it it does use a little bit of color coding in addition to the tag, um, but you're you're not able to. Um, through the menus, change the tag name. Um, yeah, but I, I bet on the output it, you could write a program yeah, that, exactly. says, that says Face ID 1 is Tommy, Face ID 2 is George, or whatever. And, and uh, like that. I mentioned to you, um, <laughs> it's a little bit scary um, because I just plugged this back in after it being unplugged all night and it still remembers who you are and who George is and I'm I'm afraid to to hook it up to the internet to see where that data is going to go. Uh, probably, you don't mind? I would appreciate it if you would do a hard reset on that thing when we get finished shooting tonight. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you how that works. Although once you're on the internet, you can never take it back. That's well, true. You better go on Google after the show and do a search for Face ID one and see if I see if I show up. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a, it's a pretty cool device, and it's one of those things that I know I've added to my ever-mounting heap of unfinished projects. But uh, this kind of was too cool to pass up, and, and it was part of a Kickstarter back in the in the fall, I think, uh, November, December. Um, they, they actually had some um, demos or um, uh, samples that were sent out to uh, people to review, I think, back in the late summer. But they only became available a few months ago, and I, I wanted to get one while they still had them because I would expect uh, these things are, are probably flying off the shelves. Yeah. I'd like to hook it up to my drone and uh, fly it around and see what it can what it, what it can do that way. Yeah, DF mm-hmm. Robot is a is a well known company in in say the Internet of Things and and uh, Arduinos you know, uh, add-on devices and such. Uh, they make servos. They, they've got a lot of lot of really neat stuff. And so I'm not surprised to see that they're offering something like this as well. Well, thanks for showing yeah, us that, it's... Mike. We want to see, when you, once you get some code written, what you might do with it. Well, the possibilities are uh, are pretty endless, I would think, uh, for something like this. Um, I know there's a video on the website on, on DF Robots website uh, where they're, do- they're demonstrating the object tracking, and there's a uh, a woman on a bicycle, and uh, I guess they had it hooked up to a camera with some motion on it, and the camera was following her around as she rode a bicycle. So that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. Wow. And just trust me on this, Mike. Go watch Person of Interest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe well, we get some application ideas. Speaking of uh, fun things to do this weekend, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, about Contest University, and you might want to go check out the recording of the live stream on the DX Engineering 
YouTube channel. It's archived there, or at least it was a little earlier this afternoon. I imagine it's still there. Uh, some really great presentations. Um, also, there is something else going on this weekend that's sort of Hamvention related. Mike, do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's the uh, the Dayton Hamvention QSO party. Uh, that's uh, that takes place tomorrow. So if you go to uh, wwrof.org, uh, you'll see a link on the on the main page for the Hamvention QSO party. And I think the organizers, uh, namely Dara, um, that group got together and decided that uh, they should have something. So they uh, they came up with the idea of having this QSO party um, that takes place tomorrow on May sixteenth. And uh, what what uh, folks should know is it's only a 12-hour event. Uh, usually they're 24 hours at least, but this one's a 12-hour event. And the contest period starts at 8 a.m. tomorrow to 8 p.m., and that's Eastern Daylight Time. So that's 1,200 to 2,400 UTC. A post from our friend Glenn, KG5CEN. He's probably in the chat room. But he oh, yeah, posted it on Facebook. There. I posted about Heil Sounds uh, Ham Radio Day, uh, Heil Ham Radio Day. And uh, anyway, he says it was rescheduled due to technical difficulties. It finally came on at 3 p.m. instead of 1 p.m. as it was originally scheduled. It's now online on YouTube if you're still interested in seeing it. And uh, you can go to the Heil Sound Amateur Radio YouTube page and uh, see see it there's a tour of uh, bob's ham shack on there and he's got some serious gear in there and uh, a lot of neat stuff i kind of glanced at a little while or earlier today i'm gonna go back and, and watch the rest of it tomorrow but anyway something something interesting to check out during the month if you want to catch up with us because you know we shoot these shows around the 15th of each month we've got some social media outlets where you can catch up on all the latest things that uh we and and our friends in there are talking about uh, a few places facebook.com slash groups slash amateurlogic.tv um where could you if you just wanted to follow us mike what would you do well you could you could follow at amateur logic or i believe at Ham College on Twitter. I'm thinking that you could go to the groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic Place if you wanted to just, you know, tag along with some of the chats and subjects and topics that we talk about. Yeah, okay. hang out with the cool group. Yep. They're all, they're all cool. And all of these are going to tell you as well when the next episode will be shot and, and streamed live. So um, join us on one of the social media sites here and Find out what's going on. Well, uh, before we go, any final words will go around. Uh, do I have any? No, just uh, go check out some of the activities we told you about earlier in the show tonight, this weekend. Since we can't do Hamvention, we can do uh, virtual Hamvention stuff. Tommy, your uh, monitor just went to sleep, but uh, do you have any thing you tell us well, I'm just going to tell you I just woke the monitor up <laughs> uh, um, but I may be going to sleep too soon but it, um, I plan on uh, participating in some of this virtual hamvention stuff tomorrow I'm going to get on the QSO party a little bit and hang, see what I can get done on there and i uh, going to finish watching the uh, Ohio Sound Amateur Radio Day video as well so there's a lot of good stuff going on. Since we, we can't go, it's a little bit disappointing. But there are some things we can do, so let's take advantage of those. Yeah, true. Email. Well, you know, guys, i got to say I have been enjoying the sound check nets that you guys have been having. So that's just another spot people can go to here. I love hearing everybody's voices. You know, I always see the chat and the, and the the Facebook and the post. But, man, hearing people and talking to them, that's great stuff. Just watch for the posts. Uh, we're having them on Tuesday. Tuesdays, that was the best time to be able to use our echo link node here. And um, uh, Jeff, 
K8JTK and, and Brad N8PC okay. are using their uh, all-star nodes to link up. So we've got uh, a lot of different ways to go connect. We've got D-Star, of course, Echo Link. Uh, I think there's a couple of DMRs, so all-star. Um, there would be like three Echo Link nodes that you could connect to, so there's a lot of, a lot of connections. Yeah. A lot like those ones right there, right over Emil's shoulder. Okay, so. Um, and that, Hamshack Hotline. That's uh, I think that's the first. I don't think I've seen any nets checking on Hamshack Hotline. And we've actually had some. So. Yeah, these two guys, these two guys, one of them, the one right below me right here. Yeah. Well, a lot of different ways you can join in the net. Uh, Echo Link, All Star, D Star, DMR. Fusion and Hamshack Hotline. and all, all the R's. And people have been turning out for them. You know, there's been pretty good turnout for yeah, these. Yes, uh, it has been. It's been uh, incredible. Yep. Uh, people have been really enjoying it. I've been enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so we have another one coming Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, so try to come check. Uh, check in with us if you can. We'd love to have you on there. So, Mike, any any final thoughts from you? Well, I, I had a final thought, and um, I guess we have Ray to thank for this one. Uh, it kind of made me think of it, and also the ICOM ad for the IC705. Um, I've been taking some heat here at home. Um, actually, uh, Mrs. V3MIC, and uh, now my daughter has been getting in on the act. Apparently, I started talking in my sleep the other night, <laughs> and only three words came out of my mouth, and those three words were, I want a radio, and then I apparently I went back to sleep. So I've been taking a lot of heat and a lot of, a lot of ribbing about that, and um, certainly any chance they get, uh, they remind me of it. So I figure I've got a plan. But I'm going to leave it a little closer to my birthday so that I can get, uh, you know, maximum effect out of it. I, I thought what I would do is, is um, if I know she's still up and um, I'll pretend I'm asleep and I'll just start murmuring, I see 705, I see 705. And maybe I'll get lucky on my birthday uh, this summer. Who knows? So is that not a common occurrence for you to say something like that in your sleep at your house? It happens all the time here. <laughs> I uh, I don't know. It's a first for me, but um, <laughs> I, I could be saying worse things in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at least it was something legit like that. So, um, yeah, well, maybe they'll take the hint. Who knows? Let me know if it works out, though. I'll try it myself. 7-3, everyone. Join us at the end of the month for the next time college. Yes, we'll actually be studying uh, coming up at the end of the month this time around rather than talking about it. So uh, join us then. Join us in the middle of next month for the next Amateur Logic and join us this coming Tuesday night for the next Amateur Logic Soundcheck Net. Seven three. Seven three. Seven three. A little late getting rolling tonight, but I don't think that'll be the first time. We had some good jokes leading up to the show. We had some bad jokes. We had some bad jokes, and we had some sound effects. What's black and brown and looks good on an attorney? What's a Doberman. A Doberman. <laughs> nice.
What kind of shoes do lazy people wear? Loafers. Mm. But that's from Eddie. <laughs> All right. I got to blow the whistle on that one. <laughs> Emil KE5QKR is so cheap. How oh, cheap is he? <laughs> Emil is the cheap old man is so cheap he can't even pay attention. Oh, wow. That one, gets, that one gets the high whistle. <laughs> All right, there's the Eddie joke before he hits the button. He said he met a person selling lamps the other day. He seemed pretty shady. <laughs>